So this morning, it is good that we will focus on our children. After all, they are literally, actually, the future of our country. But more importantly, as children, as persons, as human beings, they deserve our attention, our care, and our respect. During this critical, confusing, uncertain, and even dangerous times, I think the first thing we need to do is what we're doing now, to pause, to become aware of what's going on inside us, to become aware of what's happening around us. And this is basically what mindfulness is. We need to pause, to come together, to think together, to decide together, and act together, and to form a caring community to support each other. It is what we need to survive during this difficult trying times. So let's pause now and ask what is happening to our country and what is the impact of all this on our children. Well, first of all, we know, we feel, and we know we, that we are swimming in a sea of violence. And we are probably, I would say, in a national state of fear, which permeates our psyche, but probably subliminally, and not really discussed openly. Okay, lying is common, but it is a different kind of lying. It's not an obvious kind of lying. And many people are not aware that uh, the, the people they're listening to are lying. It's a very crafted kind of lying, not obvious. No? So we must be more aware what is if it's happening right in front of us. No? Killing is an everyday occurrence. And when I, I was trolled, because when I was interviewed in the Inquirer, I talked about EJK and the trolls came like you'll never know anything more vicious and more malicious and more untrue than what they said. No, because they were saying that maybe now killing will be kind of a normal thing for children. No way that it's going to be disastrous, it's going to be fatal. So I said, I, we cannot allow it. It must not happen. I'm not going to give up. Then I was thrown. Okay. <laughs> then you have, of course, the erosion of human dignity by verbal abuse and foul language of top officials, none less than the highest official. Okay. And what does this do to us if we are mindful of what's happening? We may think that life goes on and uh, we're just fighting and all that, but inside us there is a, a subliminal thing that's happening in our psyche. We are, our spirit and our energies are being eroded, okay? And there is also, a, I forgot to say, a national state of fear that is not talked about. Okay, so I think it's important for us to be aware of the impact of that on our own psyche and therefore what is the impact on the children. Remember, children look up to adults and effortlessly subliminally, totally can just follow or imitate what adults do. So, um, let's go back, let's go down to what we really need to talk about, which is not very pleasant, but I think must be brought out in the open. Okay? What is child maltreatment? Just defining it first. All forms of physical and emotional ill treatment, sexual abuse, neglect or negligent treatment, or commercial and other exploitation, resulting in actual or potential harm to child's health and survival, development or dignity, of dignity in the context of the relationship, responsibility, trust, or power. In other words, uh, the dignity of children is almost all the time, not, e not even uh, consciously assaulted. Okay? So, uh, as Father said, I mean, that the, the invocation was really, you know, so to the point. He prepared everything for me to give this talk today, you know. 
So this just review the types of maltreatment, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional and psychological abuse, neglect. And the settings are the home, the schools, community, workplace, and date places. Okay. So just to go briefly because I don't want to stay with the statistics, it's just a backgrounder because after that I'll talk about who are the children. Do we know all our children? Okay, the impact on the children. Just that. Physical versus physical abuse and corporal punishment and corporal punishment. In 1989, our children's rights prohibited corporal punishment under the clause on protecting children from abuse and cruel, inhumane treatment. I don't know how that, that's 89, but it's already, we don't know how that is being uh, implemented. And the likelihood of abusing physical, corporal punishment is proportional to the belief that it is a normal technique to modify children's behavior. I'll talk about that when I talk a little bit lengthily about discipline. What is discipline? How do we discipline our children uh, in the Philippines? Okay, if you look at the graph, it's disturbing because very clearly the highest or the largest percentage of the abuse happens in the home. Okay, so that's quite disturbing. And then the uh, XPJ case. Just briefly, okay, I say that, but this is more to the point. Okay, for in, in unborn in past the teenagers, uh, it shows that the ages range from unborn to 10 to age 17, 10 victims to age 17. And I think there's another, yeah, after this, after Kian, there was a 19 year old, right? Um, and Kian, celebrated case of Kian Lloyd de los Santos was the 54th. And it's what sort of awakened and uh, startled people because at least the media did not uh, stop people from putting it there. You know, so that the whole country will know that children are killed and that statement in itself is wrong. <laughs> it's bad, okay. So who killed them? I um, identified men and five policemen. If you think about it, um, identified men. I mean, who are, just anybody can kill children. I mean, you know, that might be the implication there. They're not even uh, assigned to do anything. They're just people who think they can kill children for whatever reason they have, which we don't know. Okay. <coughs> This is just some of the documented. Okay. Sexual abuse within the family. Again, this is interesting. The first, when I first did this, uh, the during dating uh, number one line there, was not yet a data. Before, it was just in the home that the abuse happens, and that's quite uh, consistent huh, in the research. But here we have during dating. So now we go to the adolescence. What happens during dating? There is new data there for me at least because I was aware of the sexual abuse within the family and community happening mostly in the home. Okay, anyway, I'll leave, leave you with that first. Okay, commercial sexual exploitation of children more widespread and uncontrolled uh, by tourists especially for developing countries, no? Ex has been increasing uh, in exponentially uh, since 1980s. No? And the magnitude of global sexual trafficking is disturbing. 79% um, of all global trafficking is for sexual exploitation. Because drugs, illegal arms, and human trafficking is really happening all over around us. And it's not easy to detect, it's not easy to talk about it in a very specific way, although there are people working on it, specifically like the Coalition Against Trafficking of Women uh, in, in Asia and the Pacific, headed by Jean Enriquez, I think. Yeah, so anyway, just to give you that. So, 
prostitution has been identified as the fourth largest source of GMP of the country. Did you know that? Philippines was rated fourth out of nine nations with the highest number of child prostitutes and validated by ECPAT International and so on. And the SWD also identified that an average increase of 3,266 new children are entering the prostitution industry per year. What's disturbing is, before this, what's disturbing is I was meeting a few weeks ago with the DSWD and the Bantay Bata. And what they told me was, we are the number one, the top country, in terms of online prostitution. We are number one. So it, it's really more than disturbing. <laughs> because uh, the, the thing that happens is, the children as young as uh, one year old or two years old are are asked to expose themselves on the internet and they get something like 2,000 to 10,000 pesos. So when you talk to the parents, it is even more disturbing. And you talk to the parents, they will tell you, hindi naman sila nasaktan ah. Hindi naman sila nahipuan. And we need the money. So it's so hard, what can you say? I mean, it's true that hindi sila lahat, you know what I mean. But it's really difficult to fight this online phenomenon that is not even uh, such a loan so much by many people. So, that's disturbing. Okay, emotional and sexual abuse. The prevalence of psychological violence during childhood was estimated at 59.2. Three out of five children have been verbally abused, threatened, and or abandoned by their parents or guardians. So again, you can see the prevalence is in the home where they are supposed to be, as they said, protected and cared for. Okay. Now, I just want to insert this slide because I want to say that when we are looking at this phenomenon, when we are uh, confronted with traumatized people, like yesterday I was confronted with that, and the other two days ago, or no, three days ago, uh, MNAC, he was in Tagaytay because of the uh, people who are working with EJKs and documenting them in the evening. For example, 10 o'clock they go to the site and document. They are not the victims, but they are highly, extremely traumatized by VT, you know, vicarious traumatization. So I say, there's a national, that's why I put the Yolanda there as a very good example of people who are not victimized, who are not survivors, who are not there, watching the television, or look, uh, looking at the images in television, are traumatized, have been traumatized, not just Filipinos, people from abroad who have been moved to donate and to help are traumatized. So there is such a thing we need to be aware of, that if a child, for example, you're working with or you know is traumatized and you are helping them, you are also vicariously traumatized. Just being aware. Okay. So there are also emerging issues. As I said, the online child prostitution is very disturbing. The other new phenomenon coming in is the HIV uh, phenomenon that has dramatically increased in the past three years. And the ages are 15 to 24. And then, of course, the migration, which is happening OFW, uh, well, just a brief thing about this because this is what uh, our institute has been doing. Uh, in the past, maybe less than 10 years ago, there was, a, there was a change in the composition of the global labor migration, meaning of the OFWs. A hundred years ago, it was the fathers, the men who would go to the who would be in the OFWs working in the fields, etc., and so on. Now it is the women. And it's very disturbing. So we did a, a study, an in-depth study, a program on, OF, on families left behind by OFW mothers. Very disturbing because, briefly, the review of literature is very intensive, but briefly, they compared the detrimental impact on children of three situations, mother away, father away, both parents away, and the most detrimental is mother away. Not both parents away. And my speculation is that when mother is away, they will put in a mother figure. 
I mean, the, my father, yeah, my mother is away, the food in the analogies. My father and what is this? Because they, they, they uh, substitute a mother figure. But when both, when both parents are away, they substitute a mother figure. But when the father is there, they assume that the father will take on the parenting. And our findings say that it is not so. That's why when we did a study, the fathers are up and lost. They don't know what to do. They feel diminished because their role as breadwinner has been taken away from them. And they are now the recipients of money from their wives. So we called it, they called it, the participants themselves, the fathers and the children called it, nawala ang ilaw ng tahanan. Remember, in the Philippines, the mother is the ilaw ng tahanan. The father is the halige ng tahanan. So, because of that finding, we, we are doing now, on the third or fourth year, a study and, and, and uh, a very in-depth and community intervention on fathers left behind and their children. And we call it AMA, A-M-M-A, AMA na magaling mag-aluga sa anak. Because this uh, phenomenon of the mothers being away was caught by Time Magazine. And it was in the byline long time ago when, I uh, forgot what it was in the cover. But uh, they, they interviewed me about it because they were worried and asking the question, are we raising motherless children? What kind of that in this generation? That was their question. It was a very worse. Anyway, the good news about the AMA is that there has been, the team has been going there, and there's been a transformation, and they are now part of the community, part of Dole, and they're very productive, but also it was very inspiring because they have, a, they have their own organization, they also do help the other fathers, but they said, So we were inspired by that. We continue to do it, we'll be doing it starting again next year, okay? Violation, exploitation of children in emergencies, this, you know this. We heard of these natural disasters, displaced families, their intents, or in evacuation centers, and many things happen there. Now, two of the children, the victims are the children mostly. And of course, child soldiers, which is another long story. Okay, many things are being, are being done. The government has the laws, not just our ACC have a plan, there are other laws. Wow, see, yes, the UD, Chandler, the Center, the Ed, Dole, and the uh, EPAT, uh, and many others, no, NGOs, a lot of NGOs are also working on this. But, you know that what we just uh, saw in terms of the graphs and the statistics, it is very sad to realize that most of the abuse happens in the home. So I think we need to be aware again and come together and go back to the basics. Let's go back to the family. Let's help our families. Let's go back to what can we do for the Filipino family so that this phenomenon of abuse does not uh, increase or even continue uh, within the home. Okay? So, Let's go more basic. What are families for? A family, family, a couple decides to have children, and it is their responsibility to provide the basic survival needs of the children, their children, survival, shelter, food, etc., protection from harm, from harm and all forms of abuse, a sense of belongingness that this is my family, and I belong here, and I'm proud of that and facilitates the development of the child's full potential. But the violence in the home, what does that, how does that happen? Okay. Before I go into that, going to basic family systems theory uh, and intergenerational patterns, you know, just to give you a little bit of the uh, overview of what is a family? A family is a system. And um, important to note there is that any stress, pain, or joy 
experienced by one member of the family is inevitably experienced by all the other members whether they like it or not because it's a system. You are affected whether you like it or not. Because uh, in Tagalog, ang sakit ng kalingkingan ay labanggawan ng buong katawan. Because it's a system. No? So, uh, very important to look at the context where the child is, which is a system, a family. No? So what kind of changes can we introduce in the system so that the system can transform? Okay. So, I, I just want to say, because I've been working with children for so long, that it's very interesting that uh, what we absorb as a young child, when we are young, when we are young children, stays with us until we are adults and will remain with us forever unless we get into a certain awareness. Why is that so? Because when you are a very young child, your critical thinking is not yet developed, and you look at your parents as the source of everything, and so um, children absorb values effortlessly, just naturally, totally, deeply, and it stays there. So, even, so in my classes, I always say to make the point very clear, when a mother is uh, not, when a mother is unloving, when as a very young child, if your mother is unloving, you do not see yourself, you do not see your mother as unloving, but you see yourself as unlovable. That is the impact of the parent's message, no? On the child. Until the child gets older, develops critical thinking, looks around and, and realizes that there are certain things my parents did that are good, certain things that are not good, and learns to discern. But without the awareness, this is the thing, without the awareness, the pattern called intergenerational family patterns continues on and on and on until you become aware and you can be to be aware you can have a, to be able to change you can have choices or to know what to do you have to be aware without the awareness you actually have no choice it's there uh, and it will rule your life okay next I would like to say also something on the aside um, we have you know when trauma happens to somebody a real trauma like abuse incest things like that okay unresolved trauma i'd like to say that unresolved trauma will fester inside the child and lead to adult personality disorders so it might be a depression a major depression unresolved trauma may be repressed but the person is affected and there are cases where the child was abused when she was four, she only knew it but because of the trigger when she was 28. And so but all the while, she was carrying it within her. And the thing is, it never goes away until you deal with it. You have to deal with it. So unresolved trauma, abuse, etc. can also lead to depression, suicidal ideation, which is now getting to be uh, more, more uh, frequent. Huh? And narcissism, meaning uh, narcissism personality disorder. Well, one characteristic of that is you cannot see any other point of view except yours. So whatever happens, you take it personally and your point of view is the only point of view that you will ever see. There is no use to argue to debate because the person will only see what his own point of view is, as narrow as it can be. <laughs> There's also a uh, deep seated fear and anger and unregulated rage. So uh, resentment builds and it does not go away until you deal with it consciously. Okay, so there, but deep seated fear can be camouflaged by rage. So a person who has a lot of anger and spews a lot of angry uh, words, etc., 
may be really underneath afraid. But the problem is, if you don't know that, you are, you are affected by the anger, but you also subliminally absorb the fear. So it's a very difficult situation, the impact of that fear and anger, the, the layer of anger covering the fear. So the more fearful and panicky a person is, the more he will spew uh, the anger. No? The same thing also. Okay. So let me share with you uh, a study and the intervention we did in the very poor community called um, Arangay Holy Spirit near Payakas. Uh, because in the statistics of the Estimate Judy in Pantay Pata, it has the largest proportion of sexual and physical abuse. But what I'd like to share with you is really the summary. What are the factors in the family that lead to or perpetuate physical and sexual abuse? Okay, what we did was we looked at the picture in terms of the family system. So there is abuse, a child's an abused child, the abuser, the non-abusive parent, and the sibling. So you see a whole system. Because when you look at the child, child abuse, it's not just that abuse child. Who is not preventing it? Who is doing it? How are the other children affected? It's really a whole system that is affected, no? Not just abuse child and the perpetrator. We also didn't want anyone to look at the external factors that are common, like drinking, vices, poverty. What we wanted to look at were their means, their beliefs. We did look at beliefs that make them Perfect, uh, keep doing what they want, but they do because they believe that it is right. So how can you change the external factors? You can't. You have to go inside them and change their mindset, change their belief. I'll let me tell you that later on. I have an example of that. So we have intergenerational patterns. You see when there's abuse, uh, in the first generation, goes on to the next and the next. That's why sometimes when I was teaching, I tell my students, you can be the pattern breakers now because you are aware. That you don't want to do it because of your awareness, you have a choice. Okay, family myths are the beliefs. So, for example, in the family, nobody should be sad. Or nobody should fail academically. So if a child or any child in the family flunks, he becomes, or she becomes a total devastation to the family because she has broken the family myth or belief. No? The quality of marital relationship is the father and the mother on the side, or the father is abusing the, the mother verbally, and the mother allows it, then the child sees that it's okay for the man to, you know, berate and abuse the woman. Just absorbs it. No? Okay, child living practices that we have. One of that is uh, um, the way we visit it. We shall talk about later because it's a big thing. The family situation also contributed and uh, the lessons of the children to why they factors that uh, lead them, not cause, but lead them to abuse or associated with abuse behavior, abusive behavior. Of course, the substance abuse of the perpetrator. They drink, they have the sinna, they go home and then they meet the wife and then the interesting thing is the wife will say, oh, but it's not So it continues and continues. And that's exactly what they say, so it continues, no? Okay, lang, okay lang, kasi pag hindi naman siya kasi, mabait siya. So kind of hard. Okay, job related difficulties, absence of the mother, this is for sexual abuse, no? the absence of the mother, whether physical, of the new working or emotional. The mother is there but doesn't do anything about the situation because maybe she is also abused and she's all afraid to do anything to the abuser who is her husband. No? Relationship and experience with opposite sex, of course again modeling how the mother experiences that and then how they experience relationships with the opposite sex. And marital satisfaction, that's not sex. <laughs> Marital satisfaction, of course, the vices. So this seemed to be, this came out as factors that contribute to the perpetuating the sexual and physical abuse within the family. But then, there, oops, 
of my words that there is also there are also resiliency factors, no? What are the factors that help to prevent it or make it uh, make them able to, you know, fight it or prevent it? And one of them is in the book that you're selling. Okay, one of them is uh, nurture, being nurtured as a young child. Okay, another is the wisdom and the, uh, the wisdom and true spelling of the child. I'll talk about that. Because we don't, we don't like to realize the children are innate truth tellers it is only allowed to society that teach them to lie. And uh, I'll talk about that also later. And also the a child's innate ability, ability that. You know? For example, one child, the mother didn't believe her, and she had an aunt in Cebu, who was, she was close to. What she did was make a call in Cebu, find somebody to help her make a call in Cebu, but she would be abused by the father, the mother didn't believe it. So she called her aunt in Cebu, and then she reported it, and the aunt helped her to get out of the house and do something about the situation. So they, are, they have their own innate and you ability <laughs> okay. to, to be able to be strong, and one of the important things is their own wisdom. You know, the child's nature, the, rest, uh, to, the wisdom to see clearly, and the child's ability to play. Play gives the child resilience. I'll talk about that later. And the mother's strength and support system. There's the mother, for example, the perpetrator, here in our study, only one mother was the perpetrator out of 12. This is always the father in our study. You know, that's also common, although now it's becoming there's a certain profile that's happening where the mothers are already being uh, abusing. Okay, but in this but most of the time it's the father. Okay, mother's strength and support system. Does the mother have a support system and her own strength to see that it's wrong and do something about it? It's also a resilience factor. And of course, the community support. That's very, very important. No? The, the media, media resource, maybe also a resiliency factor of use wisely, and people in the community, like neighbors, if they are also used, uh, I mean, uh, taken uh, as resources. Okay, so just wanted to share that with you. Now we're starting. Okay, um, community support. Okay. So uh, now let, let me stop here for a while because I want to talk about something very important, which is discipline. Okay, I think if you think about it even at a macro level, what remember why we voted for a strong man? Because I'm not kidding, but some people voted for a strong man. <laughs> Oh my God! Is there anybody here that you should shoot me? <laughs> so then, <laughs> I, I count on you. <laughs> so I'm on the same ground because I saw an again as a violent. There is no violent. No, no place for violence. No place for violence in the law school. Yeah. Oh, that one day. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 uh, corporal punishment. Okay. One thing we observe consistently in doing parenting, okay, because we do parenting for very poor families. That's one. Oops, that's one of our. That's our core or flagship program in my institute. By the way, MLAC used to stand for my name, but it really stands more meaningfully for mindfulness, love, and compassion. Okay, so parenting is nation building. That's our flagship program. As you saw, most of the abuse in the statistics happens at home. So what are we going to do? I think we have to help the parents. And one of the uh, ways that abuse happens is in the name of discipline. So most of the time, many, many times when we go to the very poor communities, what do we see? We see the parents Discipline their children, and almost always there is an insult. 
Mayroon siya po da. Bakit yung ginawa yun ng tao mo? Huwag talagang tamad mo. Parang dahil yung nagsay, just the word, why did you do that to this? May nang kasama, and it's very interesting, may kasamang insulto. It's almost always there. So what is the effect of that? I mean, you're already told not to do something, but you are insulted. Of course, that assaults the dignity and self-worth of the child. So in so we believe in the power of compassionate discipline. What does that mean? It has power. It's not a soft kind of discipline. So let me talk first about discipline with dignity and respect. Not only applicable to families, but maybe to our country. No? Uh, but discipline with dignity and respect versus punishment and insult. Uh, it, it's very important to look at the effects. No? Okay. If you're disciplined with respect, usually the child will learn it. No? They internalize it and it carries it with him and it preserves his dignity and self-worth. But if you discipline with insulto and punishment, first of all, you think it's effective. It's effective at that moment. But when the punishing person agent, punishing agent is not there, the child or the person will do it again. Para mawala yung police, pwede ka namang lumasa red light. It's not internalized. It's just fear that prevents the person from doing the act. But when the fear, well, fear object or subject or person is not there, then you can do it again. So it's not internalized, it's not uh, absorbed by and becomes a part of the child's uh, self. No? But if you discipline with dignity, it's long lasting, and the child knows why you're doing it, the child feels the respect instead of resentment, and the child can even develop compassion for others versus uh, aggression. Okay, maybe just leave that for some questions. Okay, what do parents do? Talking about discipline, oh by the way, it's here <laughs> in the school. Uh, this is young girl and you're talking about marketing, I didn't know. Okay. It's supposed to be the poorest in this thing. But anyway, what can parents do? Let's talk about discipline. Apart from many other things that parents do, the love, the care, etc. But let's talk about discipline. I formulated what I call the six C's of discipline. I should not show it yet, but to give an example, in a more community setting, I was talking to a group of teachers in, uh, in our school, <laughs> in Ateneo, a grade seven teachers, a long time ago. And then they were talking, we were talking about this thing. So they said, how can you help us enforce this rule? I said, it depends, what's the rule? The rule is all grade seven was stuck in their shirts. How oh, okay. Wait, let me ask you. Um, First, I looked around. There were teachers who were cutting shirts. There were teachers whose shirts were not cutting. Okay. But then I asked, how many of you believe and truly believe and are convinced that this rule is right and must strictly be implemented? Half of them. So I said, I'm sorry, I cannot help you implement it because you don't have the first C or of effective discipline, which is conviction. It's an internal thing. The child knows it. You may say, don't do this, and you punish it or everything, but inside you, are you really totally convinced that that rule is a good rule? So you examine first what's going on inside you rather than just what you are doing to the child. The child, remember, a child senses tentativeness like a dog's must be. They know it better than any adult. The hope is they see it, not in your words, but in the shape of your, in your eyes, in your tone of voice, in your body language, in the, the movement of your lip, whatever it is, they know. So when you just stop picture, they know. Let's go to the mama, 
they know they have an instinctive, just out, holistic, inside view, and can judge. Okay? So, conviction oops, is very, very essential, but it is one thing that is not discussed when the discipline. And of course, clarity. It should be clear to everyone. Okay? How do you know that it's clear? If the child can say in, her own, in his own words, then at least you know that it's clear. Because it might be clear to you and, uh, and your husband or wife. But for the child, it may be different. Because the understanding. And then consistency. The one of the hardest things is consistency. When you say no, you mean it, and you continue to say no, and you don't, you know, uh, vacillate. I have a very interesting experience about on this, which I can never forget. There was a mother who was doing a thesis. This is my favorite example. I think some of you know it already. She was a teacher. She was reading a thesis. And the two and a half year old son put his dirty shoe on the bed. The mother looked and continued to read the thesis. So the boy got the other dirty shoe and put it on the bed and said, Mom, you have to scold me. Because <laughs> you are not being consistent, you are not doing your job. You can only tell that you are not saying, don't do that. So I could not forget it because I was the mother. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my, 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 my oldest son. <laughs> so, but then I caught myself mindfully and said, well, the first thing I was, you would say is, no, 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 that's not him. <laughs> but instead of saying that, oops, okay, you're a psychologist, okay, so I go, ah, yes, you should not put your dirty shoe on the bed. He was satisfied. <laughs> I was doing my job. See, but sometimes we may not even be aware that we are not being consistent. I was just lucky that my son was smart enough to put it up to the psychologist's mother. No, but uh, otherwise, maybe the child will not say anything, but will not also be convinced. Okay? So, consistency. Another, me another meaning of consistency is, we do, I don't know, we do this in our uh, society. Consistency also means giving the same punishment for the same behavior. It is not that you punish those who are less powerful, doing one behavior, and the more powerful doing the same behavior, you don't punish. Okay, I think that's happening. So, yung malakas, powerful, or nekilala, or influential, we don't punish, or we don't give the consequence, and for those who are just, have no power, agad agad consequence. So I think we have to also look at that on the family context, but also on the larger context. Because uh, it's so, it, uh, the next one is consequences. Here, again, I was asked yesterday, yeah, about this big group of people I had talked to about suicide. No? Uh, and what, and, and the consequences. How do we discipline? Well, how, how come? Sometimes we're not effective. Maybe we don't give the right consequence. We are used to rescuing our children from the punishment or the consequence of their behavior. So, pagbigyan ng alam na rin. Ayan. I mean, or, uh, or don't tell the father. Huwag nang sabihin sa father, sa, 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 sa tatay kasi baka magalit tayo na lang yun. Pinagtatakpan. That's, that's the start of pinagtatakpan. It's a very small behavior that the child can pick it up. So, really, it stays there. Pwede magtatakpan na siya in the family. Pagtakpan mo na yung corruption. Pagtakpan mo na yung kasalanan. It happens. No, no consequence. So there was a time when uh, people said you could get away with murder. Nobody was jailed. There was a time when nobody was jailed. Or there is a time now when maybe the wrong people are jailed. Okay, anyway. So, to really highlight to you how important that consequence is in terms of discipline, UNESCO in 2006 called, they went to the Philippines and called a group of social scientists to talk about the culture of impunity. So they had 
social anthropology, Michael Kahn, I was for psychology, and uh, Florida Cruz, I think, for history, somebody for economics, Joe uh, of the South for justice, and so on. Why is there a culture of humility? Where is it coming from? Examine it, what can we do about it? Uh, so many things like how justice is administered, etc. cetera, macro. Mine was just really how we protect our children from the consequence of their behavior and we don't allow them to experience the consequence. This is also related to how children deal with failure. Now, for example, sad to say, and that there are people who are students who are very bright, have everything, and because there's a low grade or an unacceptable mark in their, in their record, they not only become disappointed, they cannot tell their parents, and well, sometimes they kill themselves. And that has happened. Not just once or twice. No, it's a phenomenon. It's a phenomenon of starting with not allowing the children to face negative consequences and rescuing them, but it also continues for, to mean that uh, we cannot accept failure. We cannot accept failure. So there are high expectations. Maybe we teach our children to soar, but we don't teach them how to land. And one of the very uh, significant commencement speeches I heard was the one of the Buddhist man called Pela Chodron. Her book, which is based on her commencement speeches, called Fail, Fail Now, Fail Better. In other words, fail so that we will know how to deal with failure. An example of this, yesterday we were talking about this in this big group, uh, an example of this is when, for example, a, a very, uh, an honor student, okay, flunks in math, let's just say, an example. Then the, the student says, I'm a failure. Then I said, why are you a failure? What other grades do you have? Oh, in English, I'm Asian. Okay, I think you have to reframe that. You might say, I failed in math. But I am not defined. I am not a failure. I failed in math. I got high grades in reading. I got high grades in communication. So, you failed in something. You are not a failure. No, that's another so kind of reframing that I think we need to also impart to our students. So, in, uh, the lack of punishment and the lack of consequence can also be uh, related to the lack of ability or resilience to deal with failure. If you rescue them from negative consequences, they cannot, deal, they cannot have practice in dealing with negative consequences or even sometimes of failure. Okay, so. For in that case, just remember, in skiing, for example, if you learn to ski, which I never did, uh, the first thing you do is learn how to fall. Once you know how to fall, then you can go on and learn how to ski. No, I mean, that's just a physical example, but it's good to learn how to deal with failure so you will know how to go on being successful. Okay? So, I'd like to say something that I don't know, we may not be aware of, that there's a cultural myth that we believe in. Ang bata ay bata lang yan. Okay lang, wala pa naman yung isip. Pwede mo yan, pwede mo yan, pwede mo magsalita dito, ano, di ba, hindi naman niya matalaman, hindi naman niya alam na nangyayari. Bata lang yan, wala pa yan, alam. I think we have to debunk that myth because from my experience, it is not Three. Children have wisdom and children uh, have their, uh, resilience, no? And they can teach us, as my, my son taught me, but other examples of this I'd like to say. Remember that we were working with a family of abuse, okay? This one family I cannot forget uh, because of the child's wisdom. The father was 35 years old, he was a perpetrator. This is what he said. Does anybody here Everybody speaks, everybody understands the value here. Um, no? Okay, I can say. I do. <laughs> okay, I can say. 
Okay. So the father said, oh, I say first in Tagalog the same in original. Okay lang gugugin ng bata, basta walang gugo. Kasi physically na lang yun. That's his belief. The father said, it's okay to beat up your kid uh, as long as it's not bloody, because that is discipline. If you think about it, if he believes that, and you don't debunk his belief, or don't refrain or change it, he has all the right to work in his own belief to keep doing it because it is discipline and he is, it's responsibility to discipline his kid. So he will never change it unless he becomes aware and is able to change his mindset. So our our purpose there was the mindset, not necessarily just external factors, no, in the family. Okay, what the mother said. Hugugin na niya ako, wag lang ang anak ko. Beat me up, but spare my child. That's very common. So I asked them, I asked them, is that okay? Is that an okay thing? Hugugin na ako? What's your answer? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, because I thought somebody would say yes. <laughs> Beat me up, but not my kid. Okay, it's all wrong. Okay. And then the child was being beaten up, seven-year-old boy, Sir, patayin na niya ako, huwag lang si nanay. My dad could kill me, but not my son. Kill is the word to use. So wow, I said, this is really difficult. But then, surprisingly, the five-year-old girl said, mali ang minagawa ni tatay, hindi dapat nananakit. But my father, the father is doing is wrong, or that he should hurt another person. Where did the child get it? It's very interesting because in my 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 uh, studies or my classes in family therapy, you always know that you absorb it from the family. But this child somehow absorbed it from somewhere. Because this, and then she had the wisdom to own it and to express it. So I said, oh my God, this child has real wisdom. You know, which is very surprising. I don't know exactly where it came from, and I don't even know up to now. Okay, and then there is this four and a half, I know, this four and a half year old boy. Just to say, show you how kids are able to see what's going on, and they try to do something about it. The four and a half year old boy said, to, one day, I want to die. Oh my God, this is the youngest suicide we ever have. I'm so worried. So anyway. What the story, to make a long story short, he was uh, hurting his sister and he went to the uniform for PE, etc. Just he's just misbehaving. Okay? And now play therapy, very interesting because there's there's blocks, blocks of them say, let's build the house. So we build the house. As soon as we build it, oh there's a typhoon, it's destroyed. Let's build it again. We build it again. Oh there's an earthquake, it's destroyed. Build it again, we build it again. Or oh, there's a flood. So every time we build the house, there's a disaster. So you can say that if you speak it, now you see that the child is trying to say something. Something must be happening at home. He's reflecting it in his play. Sure enough, the father lost his job and they were uh, to transfer home and to transfer school. It's a big thing for them, but they were not being, of course, told about it. No? But the point there also is. The parents were always, the parents were very young, having a difficult time parenting, independent on the grandparents, on their own parents. So what they always told the child in Filipino was, mahirap ang buhay, meaning life is difficult. But then they stopped there, life is difficult, life is difficult. So I said, if life is, is easy, if, if life is not well, you're not telling a lie. It's okay to say life is difficult because it is difficult. So you don't say life is easy because life is difficult. But you're forgetting half of the sentence. For a child to hear that, the child has to hear another part of the sentence because that's incomplete. The other part of the sentence is life is difficult, but we will make it. The child needs to hear it, has the right to hear it from the parents so the parents can handle life. But because they can handle life, I ask him, so why do you want to die, ma? Because you already very, very, I mean, they have already a very good relationship, but why do you, you said, no, you want to die, very casually. I said, why do you want to die, ma? He said, I want to die because when I die, I will be up there in heaven with Papa Dios, 
and I can help my mama and papa on earth because they're having such a difficult time. Children make hello, rescue. They try to fill in what their parents cannot do. If, for example, a uh, mother, his mother, so being enough, being given enough attention, respect by the father, uh, normally, almost always, the process is called triangulation. The child makes up for the lack of attention of the father and takes care of the mother, even if it's just a young child. So you see they have that sensitivity and the wisdom to see it, but they don't have the maturity or the developmental stage to do something about it. So they're dying a lot. This becomes powerful. The very, the very touching story of this little boy. And then there is this about resilience in Pablo in Davao. You know, Davao, Yolanda was very famous and <laughs> internationally people, but Pablo was really, really devastating. The schools, there were boulders, and we went there for like a year, we were able, we did some work with the teachers and the children there. And there was a boy, a 10 year old boy, who, who lost his parents, his grandparents, and his sibling in the storm. Wow, so he was there, he said, oh my God, this is so difficult. So he goes there, we have this like, um, art therapy and music, because he was, he, was, he was playing with the boy. And then he got a piece of paper and started writing, put things up in the corner and started writing with all intensity, you can't disturb him, he's just writing, writing, writing back. And then after that, when we gave them the, the art materials and they started to play, he said, uh, well, after part of the part of the therapy, the conversation, he said something that was so, I mean, um, touching. He said, Alam ko na, wala ang mama, na wala ang pamilya ko, pero sabi niya, Mama, Papa, mga pamilya ko, my parents, Mama, Papa, mga pamilya ko, at saan man kayo, alam ko, na mahal na mahal niyo ako, at mahal na mahal ko rin kayo. Well, uh, my parents, family, wherever you are, I know deep in my heart that you love me, and I also love you very much. We brought tears in our eyes because the 10-year-old knows that love never dies. I only encountered that with the 86-year-old philosopher Tate Nathan, who was the Buddhist monk, who says, you know, love never dies. And the 10-year-old boy told us that his love is still there, and his parents' love, and he still feels it. So I said, what's oh, resilience? The interesting thing about this is the boy was with his Nina. The Nina was a solid person, well, solid both basically. She was, she, she was solid, and she was also solid. Meaning she was a, a, a strong person who cared so much for him. So I think I felt better that this boy would be cared for, and his wisdom will be nurtured. So there we learn from this boy uh, about that. Okay, so uh, those are just a uh, few examples of children's truth telling and children's wisdom that we seldom do not know about or may not really know because we miss it or we assume that they don't have it so we don't listen deeply or pay attention in a mindful way because we assume that maybe they don't have it. It's just a, a, you know, a habit or a kind of a myth, a belief that we may not be aware of about the children. So I think it must be important to know that they do have wisdom and they're innate truth tellers and of course everybody knows about the emperor's new clothes. The only one who told the truth about the emperor not having clothes was the child, right? All the intellectual people, all the politicians, all the people surrounding the king said, oh, it's so wonderful, the thread is exquisite and this color, etc. They were all believing this, in this uh, image in the guy, the child said, but he is naked. That's the truth. And then, you know, we saw there how the child can be certain the truth. Okay. 
Now, how to preserve the truth telling and child's resilience. Uh, in the study we did, yeah, so, so we said, okay, children are innate truth tellers, how do we help them preserve it? Very interesting, in a few cases only, so this is not really like a proven thing, but it was our uh, you know, impression and our clinical kind of assessment that really one significant adult can help the child go through difficulties, go through the difficulties of war. In Malawi, for example, the example of the parent there we were talking to, the, the parents, the child, they allow the child to play during the war. They had a, a, a place there, and they had a place there where the child could be a child. And the child felt safe, even if there's a war, because the parents were able to take care of the situation. They were competent enough to handle it so the child felt safe. Kyle and Pablo had this Nina who was uh, significant means believing in the child and uh, inspiring the child, mm -hmm. believing in the child and maybe developing the child's self-worth and ability to feel good about himself and to feel his own resilience. So uh, I think it's very important to see that we can always be the significant adult in one child's life, at least. And it's very, very important to know that we can help a child in the most dire situation, in the most uh, traumatic situation. There will be possibly an adult that can accompany the child, believe in the child, be with the child, be the strong person as a model for the child, and the child will survive and thrive, even thrive. So I just wanted to share that. Okay, so going on, I might be taking too much time. So what to do? I mean, what does the child need? Well, of course, we should give the child respect. It's not easy because we can shout at the child, we can go away. You know, we usually don't think that we should respect the child. I mean, it's not like a second nature to us. Then we recognize the child's innate wisdom and truth that they protect the child from abuse and, and they have a significant amount to believe in the child. Okay, and then I'd like to insert, because this is my own life work, what else does the child mean? The child needs to play. Because this is not just important, but it is essential for the child's optimal development. Why? Because play is the most natural way a child expresses himself. A child does not need to learn how to play. He needs to learn how to do all kinds of things. But he doesn't need to learn how to play. An infant is born with the ability to play. Think about it. That's why it's the most natural way the child is able to be himself. To express himself, but also to be the most natural way that the child is. Okay. And in the book, oh, we didn't bring the book. We cannot market it. The Magic of Play. <laughs> we, we, tell, we talk about the how, how, how you help the child deal with trauma through play therapy. Okay, but maybe that just doesn't sound so significant. Let me tell you more. Play is one activity that simultaneously involves all the aspects of the total person. Well, the, the child's intelligence is exercise, imagination, problem solving, social, uh, social self of the child, respect for others, empathy, knowing when to act, when to win, win or lose. So I always joke when I talk to a big group, like maybe some of our politicians never play because how come they don't know how to lose? <laughs> okay, so then physical development, of course, you know, physical and of course, physical, moral, by the rules, do not shape emotional, awareness of one's own feelings, empathy, and ability to to uh, regulate one's emotions. I think that's one of the most soft, the most requested talk I've had in the past uh, maybe months, a year, maybe a year, uh, for 
parents of adolescents in the digital age. No? How do we help children know how to self-regulate? Which is also somehow almost equivalent to EQ, emotional intelligence, which is also related to mindfulness. Because it is the ability to know what's going on, awareness of what's going on inside me, awareness is going on around me, and being able to accept it and do something about it. So regulation of emotion. Again, that is something that's not happening around us. <laughs> emotion is spilling over like anything, especially anger. Okay. <laughs> so just to highlight it again, we did several studies. The first one is with Joy Monte. She wanted to make Keston City a friendly city. So the first thing she asked me was, what is a friendly city? And said, let us ask the children. So when we explained uh, in some ways what a city, friendly city is, talking about that. A friendly city ay isang lusot na ang bata ay nakakapaglaro. It is the number one in the tali. Isang lusot na ang bata ay hindi nasasaktan. Ang bata ay ginagala at ginagala ng mga bata ang matanda. The friendly city is a city where the child is able to play. The friendly city is a city where the child, what did I say? The child uh, is protected from harm. And the friendly city is a country. The city that uh, where the child is respected and the child respects it about. It's a mutual respect. No? And then we did another study for AIM and UNICEF. They wanted to promote or start to have child, what they call child-friendly schools. So they asked me again, what's a child-friendly school? I don't know, let's ask the children. So again, the children said in the, in the, in the responses, a child-friendly um, child school is some paaral na ang bata ay nakakapaglaro. And the sad thing is, they're telling me that the playgrounds are being eliminated. They think it's a minor thing, it's major. Because not only is the child able to play in the playground, but there's a message that it is important for the child to be able to play, not to just to sit down and work and work and work. The part of play is, has consequences. Okay. Um, and then our study on the physical and social abuse in this community. How can we know? 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 We go out to the streets, to the neighborhood, and we play with the other kids. Because it is necessary for us to play to feel better and lighter inside. Okay, and then, again, oh, at the very matter. Ano yung ginagawa niya? Sabi niya, ano wala ang ginagahanan na pagkakot. Ano yung ginagawa niya? Para isang nalubot niya. Naglaga ang lupo kami. What do you do to deal with the sadness? We play. So from the children's own words and own experience, they cope with life, they build their resilience, and they thrive if they are given the chance to play. And if not, there are dire consequences. I don't know, this is really going too far, but as reading uh, in the internet, maybe, uh, some of you may have read this, Dr. Peter Gray was speculating that the Las Vegas shooter was probably a man who had no space and time to play when he was a child. Because he had no practice in being empathetic, and no practice, yes, that's what he said, because he was very lonely. But what he said was, the American man is very lonely and feeling very isolated. That's what the, this uh, scholar said. No, but you can just think about it. But he related it to play. And I said, hmm, okay, yes. Okay, because why? Making sense of the world, according to Eric Erikson, the great developmental psychologist whom I admire very much, Making sense of the world is an enormous task for young children. They are constantly at risk of being overwhelmed 
by events and feelings. We get overwhelmed too, but they get more overwhelmed because adults decide where to live for them, what is school, etc. and so on. So children get more overwhelmed, but adults can get overwhelmed too. But play remains an indispensable harbor for the overhauling of shattered emotions after periods of rough going in the social seas. So that's how they heal themselves from the difficult, from the shattered emotions, etc. So when the child bears his father under the sand, at least he's being powerful over the father, who probably gives him up. Okay, <laughs> things like that. No? Okay. So to play is the most natural method of self-healing the childhood affords. Okay. Piaget, everybody now knows Piaget is a psychologist. Play is children's means of making sense of their experience in order to make it part of themselves. So this boy whose father left for Saudi, and he was just in school, and there he was never told that the father would be away. So he thought the father just went out. But the father, the, finally, he, after a while, he was told that the father would not come home for like a year or a long, long time. So in the playroom, he had this airplane that kept on you know, going in, back here, like here, back here, trying to come to terms with what happened, which is the kind of the father's betrayal of not telling him, or the family not telling him that he was going to leave, which is not right, no? So he was taking care of his own uh, feeling and trying to make sense of his experience and trying to heal himself Make by make, uh, coming to terms with what happened through his play. Okay, that's me. <laughs> play gives the child a sense of power over his or her environment, therefore, it's an antidote to depression. Because when you play, when a child plays, or when adults play, I've done workshops in all of the country, the one was in Guam, for male executives who ask for play therapy, for play sessions. Why? Because they were in a firm that was supposed to be creative and they had lost their creative uh, juices. <laughs> so because they're sitting in a desk and they're like, how can you be creative? So we did play therapy, uh, you know, get, uh, get rest restore their ability to be children and the ability to play. So even as you are now, 74 years old, or 80 or whatever, uh, I think every person or adult, a child or adult, needs to know how to play. Maybe our play is listening to music, maybe our play is going out to lunches with our friends and being who we are, we accepted, not trying to be who you are not, things like that. Maybe our play is how to stress from a very stressful life and surroundings, uh, but it's important that we also have the child in us that knows how to be fun, be creative, we play for the matches very serious. Just I cannot help it. I have to tell this story about the class taking a doctor in California. We had a teacher from Yale, six foot doctor Tom, six footer from Yale, very learned and all that. He was teaching transactional analysis. You know that he's like he's a as a person as an adult compared to a child. You know, so you talk to a person from the state of a child about our parents. Anyway, he was an expert in that. Little long story short, he gave us uh, grades and there were only seven of us in that whole program. So he gave us grades that were not bad. We all felt bad. How do you feel about it? I don't feel bad. Anyway, we realized that we felt bad because he was very critical. So one day he asked me, because I was also working in the medical health center as I was a student, he said, Maria, because they kind of call me honey, dangerous. So, <laughs> so really, I said, oh my God, I feel Maria, okay. So, Maria, you seem to be very angry. Oh my God, you're so cold about it. I'm just a student, a little Filipina girl, and this Caucasian, Yale, and I'm on the master's, you know what I mean. Okay, <laughs> so I breathed and said, yes, because your critical parent, using your, your work, using transactional analysis language, your critical parent is always threatening my natural child. And that's the favorite part, my favorite part of you. He didn't say anything. But after two weeks, I heard 
that we went into therapy. If I was to run the two, get in touch with this child because during parties he was serious, nobody wanted to do anything. We saw fun, we could have played, we could have laughed, and he was always talking philosophical. This guy was so limited. He was so bored because he didn't, he didn't, uh, go, he didn't develop the child in him. And I was so greatly meditated. <laughs> yes. So, okay, I want to end so that you have time. Just want to say something about, uh, 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 and this is a good topic, something, because it happens also in the bullying, no? Yeah. It happens on an individual level, it happens on a family level, it happens on an organizational level, it happens on a national level, and an international level, bullying, right? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so what is bullying? Bullying is a system. You have the bully, the bully, and the bystander. In school, when I'm in school. So the bully is a person who doesn't have that sense of competence or confidence inside him internal power that he, in order to feel his internal empowerment, which you all need to feel, he has to look for what he sees to be a weaker person and build power over, not power within, but power over someone. That's the dynamic of good. It has to be a power over another person who he perceives as weaker because the power within is not there. No? So, the position and the physical strength or authority, whatever, that, that the person uses, or practically maybe, to bully people and tell them, you know, that they are, never mind, <laughs> they are censored, <laughs> whatever, bully, bullying people, uh, sending them away, um, really building power over people and nations. And that is uh, a very important thing to understand also is what's happening in our world today. You know? The bullying is there, but underneath the show of strength due to position and, and power uh, is the lack of solid sense of self-worth inside. It's a sense of insecurity. It's hidden by layers and layers, and then the person now feels the power only if he prays and puts his power over another who is weaker. So that means there has to be another person in order for bullying to happen. Okay, so I want to end it by uh, talking about, well, the younger woman, that's the book. Okay. Uh, to, to provide, so it's very important, back to basics, how do we discipline? I think we have to go with the discipline that I was talking about earlier. Discipline with dignity, discipline with respect. Not starting with our families, starting with our children, and moving on to organizations, corporate, whatever, national level, and so on. And to understand that compassionate discipline it's not a weak kind of discipline. The power of compassionate discipline is long-lasting and it is integrated into that person. Okay, to end... I'm not okay, sorry. To end, discipline was with respect, no? Dignity and self-worth are the best gifts we can give to the Filipino children. Not coincidentally, this is also what our country needs most today. Thank you.